All right, 25 minutes before 10 o'clock. Thank you for tuning in. We are not in the radio business. It seems like we are. But the truth is we're in the communication business. And uh, as the world changes, so does the ways, so do the ways that we communicate with you all out there. And uh, Robin is so instrumental in making sure that our Facebook page, for example, has information on it. In, fa- in fact, I-, I wouldn't be surprised if you did a, a side-by-side comparison if she wasn't putting more stuff on that Facebook page than we do on the radio show. Um, and that's just the way it is. So there was a, I was listening to uh, a, f- a few things that people were saying about their businesses in, in the seminar we went to. And I was thinking to myself, gosh, these people kind of need a, uh, a little little bit of training on, on communicating, getting the word out. They're kind of leaving important information out. But, of course, I'm in, a, in an audience. I guess it was about 300 people. It was a thing we went to in um, uh, Chattanooga a couple of years ago. So there is a book that would have helped them. And I didn't even know this book exists. I'll put the cover of the book on the streaming video that we're doing right now. Lauren Sergi is the author of the Handy Communication Answer Book. Um, it's a lot of stuff that we've known because we work in this business, Robin, but a lot of stuff we've never known before, uh, especially history-related stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, Lauren is a, a trainer on public speaking. You probably could have figured that. She's a communications rhetoric and critical thinking uh, speaker. Am I saying it right, Robin? Now yes. I'm not doing a good job here. <laughs> no, she's wonderful. I'm, I'm reading here. Uh, she's a contributor <laughs> to the library journal, The Wealthy Gorilla. I love that title. The Wealthy Gorilla. Duct tape marketing. <laughs> That's another favorite. <laughs> uh, young upstars, and she's written the book called The Handy Communication Answer Book. Good morning, Lauren. How are you? Good morning, Larry. I'm fantastic. Yourself? Good. You, you, just the way you talk, you even articulate well. Good morning. Uh, where, 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 <laughs> she right. wrote the book. <laughs> where, yeah, I know. You're the, I, I'm a little nervous. I, I, I should totally well hope so. It's kind of incumbent on me to be like that. See that? I'm, I'm nervous talking to you because I do this for a living and I'm afraid <laughs> that I'm going to pale compared to you. So, so where are you right now? Where, where are you calling from? I am calling from Edmonton, Alberta. Wow. Of the border. I, I, yes, I, I know that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. For, how's the weather there today? How, is it starting to get cool yet? Uh, you, yeah, kind of. The, the mornings are starting to get a bit cool, but right now it's it's blue skies, very clear, sunny, and going to be a gorgeous day. Oh, nice, nice. So what did you, what was the, the reason for the book? Were you listening to, try, you know what happens to us? We get people sending us announcements. Would you please mention this on the air? And, and once it passes the test that it, do, that it does not qualify as a paid commercial, and it's like an announcement for, <laughs> you, know, you know, once it, yeah, once it passes those tests, so we say, yeah, we can read this on the air, we realize that these people need help. And, 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 in, and in a very gentle and kind way, I mean. And, and I, so I'm so glad you wrote this book. I'm I'm glad that you're enjoying it like that, and that's the whole point of the book is to is to help people become a little more comfortable with everyday communication stuff. It's such a big source of stress for so many people. One of the things I wanted to ask you about during this conversation is uh, if you could tell us how to handle um, obstacles or maybe distractions that cause communication to be compromised a little bit. I'll, I'll tell you, part of it is right here in front of me. Um, when I first started doing radio, I was so distracted by the buttons and the dials and the and the VU meters and everything else that I was supposed to pay attention to that the real job I was doing with the other, the other person in the equation, the person who's the listener, they weren't really getting any communication from me. They just had me. <laughs> who knows? Who knows what I even said? Now I've learned to kind of ignore all of these dials and all these knobs and everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that was one distraction that I can use as a as a, as an example. But I'm guessing radio is unusual. Most people don't communicate at a at a mixing board like I do. Well, yes and no. If you consider a computer screen and keyboard a mixing board, and all of those wonderful little tabs that we have open in Windows whenever we're uh, whenever mm. we're on the phone or at work, then people are actually dealing. Like we deal with communication in a constantly distracted state now, and it's actually really difficult to deal with, particularly that aspect of the fact that so much of our daily, like our business and our work communication, is done in front of a computer. And you can't read email and have a conversation at the same time. It's impossible. <laughs> That's a good point. That's a good point. <laughs> and uh, you, you, you uh, bring that up in your book because you have a. Uh, 
part there where you say what's good what what is the proper time for emails and what is the proper time for phone calls yeah yeah and i say those are those are two very separate activities if you need to have a conversation with someone so you need to have to go back and forth check for understanding make arrangements that sort of discussion then the phone is actually going to be a more efficient way most of the time if you just need to give them one or two lines if you can say what you need to say in a couple of lines then email is great but the longer you have to go back and forth the more difficult and and time consuming email can become uh, I, I worked for the state of Florida for about seven years, and I worked at the juvenile detention center. And when a when a juvenile was arrested, um, sometimes the parents would come in, and and usually that was a good thing. If a parent comes in, that means there's probably not that much trouble uh, because somebody cares for that child. But anyway, so a, a parent would come in, and here's one of the things I would observe: the other workers would often tell the parent things and a lot of times shop talk came out in other words uh maybe acronyms that we used behind you know in in our work they would use those acronyms talking to these parents and i said at one meeting we had later on i said i think we should learn how to speak so that the people who come in aren't intimidated by our jargon we can't be using jargon at this moment no they've got their they're scared to death about what's happening and and we're throwing you know acronyms at them that they have no clue what they mean you're 100% on the mark there, Larry, and that's something that can become really tricky for a lot of people. And what you did there is what I call taking an audience-focused view of communication. And that is a skill that very good communicators use. They think, okay, how is the person who's receiving my message, how is my audience going to be able to work with the information that I'm giving them? Right. A lot of us, we have, an, we have a me-focused communication method like we're so wrapped up in our own heads that we don't stop to think that wait a minute they might not know what this five letter acronym actually means and right, they right. might not be comfortable asking me to clarify um, so by taking that audience point of view you just really clear things up you make it easier yeah. for the other person to communicate with a you another little bit of a humor a humorous example of this is between the countries that speak english we don't all use the same words i i have a, <laughs> a i have a little story i was on an airplane years and years ago when smoking was still allowed on airplanes and i was sitting next to a guy from england and he, he asked me if fags were allowed on the airplane <laughs> and I said, oh, no. and I know, and I had no, I had no idea at that moment. I didn't know that 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 was slang for a cigarette. And so I said, yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure it's okay. <laughs> so that. Could, Fantastic story. But I don't know if that happens between Canada and the U.S. I think we've pretty much got the same tra <laughs> jargon. <laughs> Our jargon is really similar. It's really similar. What, what I find fascinating, and this is what I really like about U.S. communication, is that you have more distinctive pockets of cultural jargon within your cities and within your regions than Canada does necessarily. Really? Um, you know, of course, if you, if you take... Now, keep in, in Canada, our oddball is Newfoundland. They have a language completely under their own. <laughs> and, of course, Quebec, which is mostly French-speaking. But the sort of slang that you would see in New York can be segmented out to the slang that's in Manhattan versus the slang that's in Jersey. Yes. Your dialect, especially on the East Coast, are almost like what you get within the dialect in England, where it can, not, to the, not quite to the same degree, but it, where it's almost neighborhood by neighborhood or district by district. Okay, but, it's but uh, fascinating. Okay, okay, but with that topic in mind, uh, one of the things that I, I cringe at is when I hear a politician using jargon that is maybe more appropriate for a teenager. And, and they do it to try to gain acceptance or, or, or they'll speak in a dialect of the area they're speaking to. Uh, uh, who was the guy? Bernie Sanders had a clear New, oh. New York accent, you know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I can't imagine him in Alabama starting to have a southern accent. But, right. but, but I think Hillary was doing that. And I'm she not, was. I'm not playing politics <laughs> here. I'm just saying yep. it was. if I was their coach, I would say, you know, just speak the way you speak. You don't got to slip into yeah. an accent, right? Yeah, you re you don't well, definitely don't slip into the accent because the people who actually speak in that accent will pick it out so fast it'll make your head spin. Um, 
there's there is a certain sort of mirroring that we will do when we change up audiences. So generally, someone might adopt, like a politician, will adopt a little more of the slang that they're that the people that they're speaking to are used to. And you do need to be able to adapt slightly that way. But if you go too far, what ends up happening is what's called a breach of decorum. So that's a breach of how we think the way things should be, what we expect from the person that we're speaking to and whether or not we think that's appropriate. So if someone goes too far with the slang, it will look like they're trying too hard. And that makes them seem disingenuous. Some people are very good at this. I would say that Obama was quite good at shifting, and again, this is not to play politics at all, Obama was very good at shifting that decorum, at shifting his language according to who he was speaking to. Yes. If you look up in Canada, Trudeau is very good at that. Mm-hmm. He's a little on the millennial side for some of the uh, for some of the old timers up here. Right. A little on the millennial side for right. them, right. but he's still very good at shifting that. Whereas, if someone like if someone who had a much more regal sort of or or very traditional stuffed shirt sort of politician air tried to do that, it wouldn't go over as well. So, for us, if our former prime minister Stephen Harper, who was known for being kind of stodgy tried to slip into the millennial speak the way that Trudeau does, we would look at him sideways and think, that's not right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sure so, you, I'm sure well, you would. So it, it's important to know what you can get away with. So give, and, and that's one of those soft things in politics that, that, that we just need to wrestle with. Give, give some advice to anybody who is going to be making a presentation before a group of people, whether it's the, the Ladies Guild or, or you know, a 3,000 person audience or anything in between. Do they write it first and then speak it? Do you, do you ever recommend that you just wing it? Uh, and if you do write it, do you, do you ask somebody, can you listen to me and do I sound like I'm reading it? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> What is, oh, what is your okay. advice? Oh, Larry, you have opened up just, you've opened up my glory area. Um, Ooh, so <laughs> we got that it, on yeah, and actually, Oh, yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Don't go there, Bob. <laughs> 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 this I'm is glad. a bad habit that I have to make dirty <laughs> comments without realizing it. So this is. Uh-oh, where'd you go? No, oh, she said she would call back if her phone dropped uh, off. <laughs> she must have known. Must have opened up my glory area. I'm glad you made a comment, Robin. I mean, <laughs> oh, my gosh. I wonder if she knows she dropped off. Yeah, we'll have to wait and see uh, when, when she doesn't get a response there. She said she'd call right back yeah. when... You want me to call her? No, she said she would know. So okay. The book is yeah. called The Handy Communication Answer Book. Uh, Lauren Sergi... S-E-R-G-Y is our guest, and I, I trust she'll be calling back, and we are up against a break anyway, so let's take that break, and we'll be right back, hopefully, with Lauren, and that should be in about three minutes. The weather is brought to you by MyFWC.com. Safe boating is no accident. Clouds will limit sunshine Friday. A couple of showers and a heavy thunderstorm in the area, high 86 to 90. Rather cloudy Friday night with a shower or thunderstorm, especially near the coast, low 73 to 77. Variable cloudiness for Saturday with a couple of showers and a thunderstorm. Some can be heavy, the high 85 to 89. For Sunday, mostly cloudy with a shower and thunderstorm or two, high 86 to 90. From the Florida Weather Center, I'm meteorologist Joe Lundberg. Hi, this is JP from Penn Flooring here in Ocala. I would like to invite you to come in and visit our spacious showroom where we have solutions for every style and budget. From wall-to-wall carpet to hardwood floors and tiles, we have an unsurpassed selection of flooring. At Penn Flooring, we've provided quality customer service with a family touch for over 25 years. Visit our website at penflooring.com or come by our showroom, 1201 Southwest 17th Street, just over the bridge. Penn Flooring, quality customer service with a family touch. Hi, my name is Erica Olstein. I'm a doctor of acupuncture and oriental medicine. Do you have a gout-ridden toe or bowels that move too slow, creaky knees, or how about an asthmatic wheeze? Then acupuncture is sure to please. Come visit me, your primary care physician, Erica Olstein, at A Better You Healthcare. Call me at 352-615-5566. That's 352-615-5566.
Hey, this is Matt Wilkerson from Verizon. You work all day, right? So why would you want to spend your night out shopping for that new phone? Well, Marion County, let me and Verizon help you out. I can deliver to your home or office, saving you precious time. Phone, tablets, internet, home phones, even accessories. Whatever you need, we will deliver free of charge. Call me at the store, 352-528-0020. That's 528-0020. All right, 10 minutes before 10 o'clock. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, our guest, Lauren Sergi, is back on the line. And, uh, well, she kind of dropped off at, a, at a kind of an appropriate time. We, we uh, had a commercial break anyway, so that worked out nice. The book is called The Handy Communication Answer Book. Uh, Lauren, I trust you're still there? I am still here. And did we drop off, um, ho- hopefully not too shortly before I made an un- un- unintentionally yeah, right after statement? The, right after you said something <laughs> about a glory hole, right after then. Oh, no! <laughs> we said something. <laughs> it was area, not hole. Oh, area. Area. Oh, area, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Uh, well, one of the of, of the great things about your book is that you've got uh, speaking per- perspectives from the heroes and the villains of the world throughout history. I found fascinating. Oh yes, we we need to look at both, and so and I mean a lot of it. And this is not to equivocate history. A lot of it does have to do with uh, with who wrote the history, but there's. There are clear heroes and there are clear villains, and we can learn a lot from how both of them speak. Uh, the, the one thing that I try to do when we put together something serious on this show is instead of saying according to studies, we'll say according to a study at the University of Florida or wherever. Um, and I notice a lot of people make this mistake. They'll, they'll say, uh, experts say... And they'll never tell you who the experts are. I, I exactly. kinda, it's kind of like almost like you feel like, well, are you sure you're not misleading me? Oh, it's intentional misleading. Unless they genuinely can't remember who it is they're talking about. I mean, yeah. you might do this in casual conversation, because, of course, you're not expected to have a, an entire reference list or, or works cited list in front of you to be able to pull these studies from. Right. But if someone is trying to make a, a really significant statement, so if they're releasing something to the press or they're actually getting up and delivering a presentation and they are giving pieces of information that are supposed to be cited in scientific studies or wherever, then you best be ready to actually present that information. Otherwise, it's intentionally misleading others. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think it happens all the time. One, one of the observations of anybody who's paid attention to the news is that I'm just comparing today to maybe the 50s or the 60s, when uh, journalists tried to steer away from using words and phrases that it's uh, probably intentionally persuaded the reader to feel one political direction or the other, where, it, where it's in every story today. I mean, every single story has some kind of a, of a slant to it. Yes, it really does. Um, the, the news has become very, very partisan. And that's something that has become more of a trend in more countries as we move on. Part, I think that part of that is because it's easier to generate 24-hour news cycles by focusing on the various outrages that exist. It's easier to create news effectively when you're, when you're able to point at someone and say, hey, look at this little tiny thing they did here, now let's talk about it for five hours. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and a, a more bipartisan, a more neutral standpoint takes a lot more time to do research on, and you tend to have less material to work with because it's simply not as sensationalistic. Uh, you also address uh, visual communication in there. You bring up sign language, uh, you bring up body language, because sometimes all communication is not just all audible. Mm-hmm. It, it's, far from being, it's far from being just our words. And the sort of communication that the nonverbal stuff gives you, so that tone of voice or body language, the way that we hold ourselves, what that can give is a lot of context in terms of how the person is feeling, and particularly subtext. So what's going on behind the words that they're saying? Do, is, is there, are they saying things that are supposed to make them sound like they feel comfortable in this situation, but their body language is indicating that they're really quite tense? If so, then maybe what they're saying is not 100% on board. You can, you can really infer a lot, a lot more of a deeper meaning 
from what people are saying based on all of the other stuff that they might be communicating. And that's where email gets tricky. We have no nonverbal communication in email. It's all words. So we can actually insert our own things. When we're reading a message from somebody, we might insert our own tone of voice in our interpretation of that message. And all right. of a sudden, right. if, we're, you know, if we're in a bad mood, then maybe we read that email in a snarky tone. Right, or we insert right. sarcasm that the writer never intended on being there. That's where misinterpretations can really happen. Yeah, and I, and I see that all the time. It's, uh, there was a, uh, a one of those uh, portable marquees outside of a church that said there are more people being offended than there are people offending. And I think a lot of that has to do with communication just not being received the same way it was intended to be. Yeah, it, that's that's very true. And I mean, to get really geeky, right in the front of the book, there's um, a diagram of the communication cycle, and it show, it goes through all the paths that need to happen for communication to occur. And there is always a sender and a receiver, and the receiver plays as an important role in communication as the sender does. And if you're the person listening to the message, you're the receiver, and you need to keep in mind that you're also adding meaning. You're adding your own meaning to what you're hearing. And the meaning that you're adding might not be what the sender intended. So us as audiences, we need to take some responsibility of the messages that we're receiving and how we interpret them. Uh, you do a, a marvelous comparison between speaking with children and speaking with seniors. It seems like life comes full circle. It does. It, it really can. That's something, especially as our population ages and as lives get longer, that we need to take into consideration. And it's not to say that we should speak to seniors like we do children. Not at all. Mm -mm. But sometimes, depending on their hearing or their cognitive state or whatever, whatever it might be, we might need to speak a little bit more slowly and give a little more time for the information to be processed. Oh yeah, but yeah. that yeah. But keeping that in mind, the seniors that we speak to are bringing a lifetime of context and understanding that children don't have. So it's about being sensitive to the individual, and like you said at the beginning of our chat, Larry, being aware of how they might be hearing or receiving the information that you're giving them. Yeah, I, I, I love what you just said. I, I, an, an example I can tell you, Robin and I play music, and uh, basically our audience at this point in our lives <laughs> is, <laughs> is, is nursing homes, okay, or assisted, assist, assisted living facilities. Used to be children in elementary schools. But, 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 but anyway, I want to tell you something that I've noticed. Other musicians who also have kind of gotten to this point, you know, we used to be young and, and played in bars and colleges, and now we're doing this. I mean... I mean, very few of us actually got famous. So, so, <laughs> I, so I, I, but I've noticed some of them. They'll stand up there and they'll play this old man. He played one. My, mm -hmm. my, you know, my Bonnie lies over the ocean, and their and their conversation w between songs will be, um, well, here's one I think you probably will remember. And I said to Robert, we can't do it that way. We got, no. we got to be normal to them. And, we are, and so we we will we rock. we'll make them laugh. We'll be you know a little bit naughty, and I, and I and they are fine. They're fine with that. They get a kick out of it. Yeah, and play songs oh, from absolutely. their era. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, just because you're speaking to someone of a of a different generation doesn't mean that you can't connect in an authentic way with whatever's going on now. You know, like speak to them as though it's today. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I love what you're saying. I love the message of your book. There's no way in the course of a short interview we can cover everything. If you are in any way communicating with anybody else in your life, and that applies to every single one of us, the Handy Communication Answer book will help you uh, at w whatever level, especially if you're trying to do it professionally, or at least maybe you have to uh, address your employees or, or the, the other workers. Uh, so I have a copy of the book. Call me if you want the one that was sent to me by Lauren. Uh, the rest of us have to go buy it. Lauren, give us a website so we can buy the book. Uh, absolutely. Easiest way to find the book is through laurensergy.com. That's L-A-U-R-E-N-S-E-R-G-Y.com. But honestly, if you just type Handy Communication Answer Book in any search engine, you'll find it. And I did find it on Amazon, and uh, you got yep. five a, star, a five star review. Good for you. Um, yeah. Leave me reviews. Reviews on Amazon are good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank they really do help authors out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lauren. That's Thank, my shameless Thank you so much. All right, we've got to take a little break, and we'll be right back. This is WOCA Ocala. Fox 
News Radio. I'm Lillian Wu. Growing concerns as Harvey lurches toward the Texas coast. First, I wasn't really worried about it until everyone at work was like talking about it. Harvey expected to make landfall as a Category 3 storm with the potential to dump up to three feet of rain in some areas. This would be the Trump administration's first test dealing with a major natural disaster. The president talked yesterday with Texas Governor Greg Abbott this morning retweeting something that uh, Abbott said out last night where Abbott said, quote, spoke with President Trump and heads of Homeland Security and FEMA. They are helping Texas respond to Hurricane Harvey. Yesterday at the briefing, Sarah Sanders, the press secretary, said that the White House is poised to respond to any damage in Harvey's wake. Fox is John Roberts. And in the case of an infant found alive three days after being left in a garbage bag in a New York backyard, a 17-year-old girl now arraigned on charges. Fox News, we report. You decide. Sometimes, what you want most from your car is nothing. No headaches, no surprises, no anxiety when it's late at night and you're on some distant freeway in a thunderstorm. That bit of nothing is everything. And that's what you get when you purchase a certified pre-owned Mercedes-Benz from your authorized dealer. Because only an authorized Mercedes-Benz dealership has the skilled technicians to certify that your pre-owned vehicle is up to Mercedes-Benz standards. Only Mercedes-Benz can back their certified pre-owned vehicles with an unlimited mileage warranty for up to five years, with roadside assistance included. It's time to experience confidence that's as unlimited as the warranty. Visit the certified pre-owned sales event now through August 31st, and you'll receive two years of prepaid maintenance and special